I'd like to begin by speaking to a comment that came in uh, privately in the chat in which someone said to me essentially, when in the middle of considerable emotional distress, even a sense of brokenheartedness, whatever it might be about, including perhaps the state of the world uh, or the state of certain aspects of the world today, um, how can one find a sense of contented, open-hearted being? And it's a really important question. Anytime, you know, the, the base practice, the foundational practice is to be with whatever is arising, whatever is appearing, to be able to be mindful of it, ideally without being entirely invaded by it or swept away by it. That's our base practice. And with time and maturity of practice, that often becomes just a very, very uh, ongoing resting state. Great. It's also true that as the Buddha identified, there are many factors or trainings that we can cultivate that are beneficial, including helping ourselves in increasingly, increasingly dwell in certain ways of being, to dwell, in other words, in a sense of inner calm rather than agitation, to dwell in a sense of warm-heartedness rather than grinding a grieved resentment. Pretty good. To be able to, let's say in meditation, to find a sense of being distinct from uh, becoming or rumination that takes us away from simply being. These are trainings. These are developments. Now, as we train in them, as we develop in them, on the basis maybe of a suggestion from a teacher like me, uh, it may just be out of reach. Then we go back to the base practice. Over time, though, in the progression of three steps that Melarepa talked about, you've probably heard me say it, in the beginning, nothing came. In the middle, nothing stayed. In the end, nothing left. That's the progression. And if we're listening to some well-intended person like me who's suggesting that the, you see if you could find a sense of being content in the, the enoughness of the present. And you think, that's ridiculous, <laughs> or no way can I feel that. That's okay. It's okay. It's right now, not your time, not your day, not this practice, maybe not this teacher, uh, not today. And then, you know, you come back to whatever is helpful to you. On the other hand, if um, there are ways of being, dwelling places for the mind that are pointed out or modeled by various teachers that seem like, oh, there's some value there. There's some value there. Then there's a place for a kind of intentionality, a kind of leaning into developing these qualities in ourselves through dwelling in them as experiences while receiving them into ourselves so they become increasingly what dwells within us. That's a broad and important general statement. Second, um, uh, as someone pointed out in the, in the chat, uh, it's ironic that for me to talk about self-reliance in a context of a Buddhist tradition that is very much about deconstructing the apparent self in a particular meaning there. And the basic distinction I'm going to make, which will then uh, enable me to get into this topic, uh, is that clearly there are persons. And persons can have tendencies or qualities that are beneficial or harmful, that are happy or full of suffering. Um, and persons are real. There are persons, no doubt. As to whether there is the kind of presumed entity inside who is uh, unified and enduring and independent of events. Well, the Buddha really critiqued that notion, really critiqued it and deconstructed it again and again and again. And the, and the import of that argument is that at the end of the day, you can't really find such a one. Now, what you can find is appropriate amounts of recognizing oneself as a person 
you can uh, have uh, appropriate and helpful continuities of a sort, uh, you know, that are like eddies in a stream that have a certain dynamism and a certain, you know, they're, they're not like bricks. They're more like swirls that have some persistence to them. You can find those continuities between your yourself in the broad sense uh, today and who you were, let's say, way back when, when you were nine. That, no problem. No problem. It's when we um, get caught up in a, presuming there's some kind of fixed entity inside and uh, getting get caught up in doing various things that are saturated with you know references to me myself and I you know my precious and all the rest of that that's where it gets problematic so let's just dive in let's just dive in and see what's helpful here especially at the psychological level at the practical le level rather than getting into kind of philosophical uh, abstractions about it let's give it a whirl okay all right. So I want to begin with a classic kind of exhortation uh, in Buddhism, a challenging statement. This one comes from Dogen, which I put in the chat. Great is the matter of birth and death. Quickly passing, gone, gone. Awake, each one. Awaken. Don't waste this life. It's a pretty powerful statement, right? From a great Zen master around, I think, 1200, 1300 in um, ancient China and, and Japan. So there's this call to us, whether it comes from the Buddha or other great teachers, there may be a call to us just in ordinary understanding. We look around and, um, you know, my own parents have passed away. Uh, my grandparents certainly have passed away. All but one of my uh, aunts and uncles have passed away. I too will eventually pass away in this body, certainly. And there's a reality to that. We see it. We face it. Uh, and you know, <laughs> one of the good Robin Williams movies, uh, right up there with uh, Goodwill Hunting, is the Dead Poet Society. Or you may remember that Robin Williams, in his role, I think, as an English teacher, is taking these um, very, very privileged young men in this elite residential high school, boarding school, and they're walking through the hallways. I think this might be the freshman class coming in. And he's showing them these trophy cases with all these black and white photos of younger uh, graduates of this elite boarding school 40, 50 years ago with various trophies and their you know, rowing uniforms, their yachting uniforms, and all the rest of that. And he, he's pointing out how you know, vigorous they all were and how distinguished they all were. And then he looks at these uh, 14 and 15-year-olds and says, essentially, from this is from my memory, they're all dead now. They're all gone. Carpe diem, boys. Seize the day. So we have this, this teaching to us. What is it? What does it actually mean? What can we do about it. So I want to share with you three really quite personal stories and uh, as examples of the self-reliance that is very present in the encouragement of the Buddha. And I invite you as we explore this to look back at your life in ways in which you have relied on yourself. You've been deliberate. There's been a sense of agency. There's been a sense of responsibility. There may have been a sense, and this is what I'm talking about in terms of so what is self-reliance. There may have been a sense that has a, that had a kind of um, disappointment in it, in which you realized that rescue was not coming, help was not on the way, it was on you, and maybe there would be a sense of being let down by others, perhaps, or a kind of disenchanted waking up that realized that maybe there had been a childlike expectation of provision or scaffolding or support uh, from others as an adult that is based on expectations from childhood, whether or not they were fulfilled when you were young. So I want to invite you to really look back at your own life in terms of both times that you've been self-reliant. You can relate to this experientially, emotionally, deeper than the abstractions, 
which is what's really important. And today, as you look out over the sweep of your life today, all these various sectors, aspects of your life, including potentially uh, ongoing problems, maybe with other people, a particular person, or maybe there are some unfulfilled longings, or maybe you've got some behaviors that you could kind of sort of get away with when you were in your 20s or 30s, like a certain level of consuming alcohol maybe that, you know, is not good, not good as you, as you age. Uh, maybe you could get away with not re exercising regularly. Uh, but, you know, as you age, you realize, whoa, I need to start building some muscle mass in some reasonable and sustainable way, whatever it might be. You look out in your life today and you can see both areas where you do take responsibility, you do call yourself to a higher road, you do focus on your side of the street, aspects of self-reliance, you do these things, uh, you do nudge yourself in, in, in forms of discipline that are helpful. Okay, check, check check. And maybe there's one area that can really become apparent to you as you listen to this talk live right now or later on recording, where you go, you know, I really could rely on myself more and realize that it's, that it's kind of on me. It's kind of on me there. And I got to do it. Carpe diem. I got to seize this day and call myself to, to doing this thing. So three stories, I'll say them kind of briefly. Uh, you may have heard me talk about one of them, which I've written about. Um, when I was six years old, I think I would have been five or six, I lived in Illinois with my family. Um, at that point, I had a younger sister. And I very distinctly have this powerful memory. There was a powerful experience in which I'm standing 100, 200 feet away from my home, looking back at it with a yellow light coming out of the windows at, at sunset at dusk. And I'm standing on the edge of a cornfield. The ground is rutted with the muddy tracks of the tractors and bulldozers with uh, rainwater left over in them. And I'm feeling wistful. I'm looking back at that house and I just have a sense of a kind of unhappiness that was uh, not mine. It was being made in that home, mainly by my parents and the issues they were grappling with, normal range things, but still a fair amount of unhappiness that I just felt separated from. And wistfully, sadly, I felt deeply that it was up to me to find my own way, to find my own way. And, and I recall looking out at the twinkling lights on the hills in the distance there and imagining the homes and the people and the families and the, and the others. And then it was up to me to find my way to those, to those happier relationships. I invite you to consider, if you have any access to it, uh, times when you too were, were quite young and you had a kind of knowing in you. Maybe it was pushed away, it was probably hard to talk about, but still there was a knowing in you of a, whew, I gotta deal with some things. How am I gonna do it? I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but I know I gotta deal with them. A certain sense of that, maybe. That's my first story. Second story, I was about 29 and I had had uh, some early success at UCLA and early success in the human potential movement. But after that, I was probably about a four or five year period or longer of kind of wandering around in the wilderness, not really knowing what I was doing, getting quite into partying and um, goofing around and all that. Fun, fun, fine. Not really settling down into any kind of particular occupation or work, dabbling here, dabbling there, one project, not a project. Um, and definitely a fair amount of partying. And I remember vividly this moment where I walked into the bathroom, you know, after staying up late yet again, watching yet another stupid movie, Loaded, and I just saw my face. 
the bloodshot eyes, the you know the kind of toxicity in the face, and and I had a really a moment of truth there and feeling the the drift in my life, and kaboom, there was a real telling moment that I had a choice. I was at a fork in the road. What am I going to do every day? What am I going to do? And I realized really quite vividly with that example in the mirror right in front of me, no, that is not a guy I want to be. You know, once, twice, 10 times, explore it. Maybe there's a year where you do a lot of that, but no, no more. Too far. Correction. And also get it more together about what in the world I want my work to be as I engage life. So that too could be a kind of turning point where you realize that it's on you to sustain your sobriety of one kind or another, uh, which you know might include some indulgences, but on the whole, is there a, a, a sense of balance and sustainability and, and respect for the temple of your own body and your relationships? You know, it's, it's on us. And it's on us to recognize when we've taken a bad turn. You know, maybe it was fun for a while. Maybe there are reasons we took that turn. And still, there can be a wake-up call so that, too, might be something you could reflect on as a kind of self-reliance, wake-up calls in your own life where you realize, whoa, it's on me. No one else is going to turn this course here. No one else is going to stop me from indulging myself in these ways or just, you know, circling the drain, as it were, in my life. Whoa, it's up to me to get, that, to get out of the sink <laughs> instead of circling that drain. And then I'll tell you a third story. Um, I was at that point under contract to write my first book, Mother Nurture. And um, so this would be after I got licensed as a psychologist and I was deeply interested in children and taking care of them, which led me to a focus on supporting mothers and young families because as the, as the womb, in a broad sense, of the next generation, what an important thing to do to take good care of, of the people who bear all of our children and rear most of them, uh, the mothers, and which then leads into, of course, supporting their relationships with partners. Anyway, so it was on, so I, we got a contract. Yay, I had my co-authors uh, and they were supportive, but I remember vividly, I had gone on a little vacation. Our kids were young at that point. I had taken them actually to Joshua Tree Park and they were out for, they were maybe in this, out for the day with, with my brother, uh, their uncle. And there I was in the hotel room looking over the draft of the first chapter, the most difficult and most important chapter, usually in a nonfiction book, uh, maybe fiction too. And there I was um, struggling with it. And I kept hoping that somebody else, my editor, my co-authors would do it for me. And I remember vividly recognizing that this very important uh, project that I cared a lot about and which could have a lot of beneficial effects for my family and my career, oof, <laughs> no one but me was going to get those words on the page. No one but me was going to fix the problems in the 5,000 words in a typical chapter. No one but me was going to get it in to the editors on time uh, to go forward with this book. No one but me. And you too might have examples where you realize that there might be something important. There might be maybe an important communication to make in a family. No one's going to make it except you, maybe. Or you might realize that... Um, you know, there's a thing to be done in a business or in your work or in a team that you're part of. And you realize that even if they ought to do it or ought to hold up their own end of the log in a better way, it's on you. It ain't going to happen if you don't do it. Maybe there's an aging parent you're involved in caring for. And there's a, the usual mess of a family system trying to rally around but not and you know, all kinds of you know backwaters and swirling eddies in that stream. And you realize, you know, no one's going to call it with the doctors unless I do it. No one's going to get a better doctor unless I do it. No one's going to check in with a lawyer to make sure that this trust is right unless I do it. You know, there's that moment where you realize that, right? And 
as I look at Deb's comment now, part of what comes up sometimes around self-reliance can be very emotionally positive, a sense of a certain scruffy, you know, <laughs> there's a phrase from one of the sailing novels, the O'Brien novels, Master and Commander, a surly triumph, you know, as the doctor character actually operates on himself to extract a bullet that has been shot into him, a kind of surely triumph. <laughs> you know, there can be a place where when you're on your own, you realize, yeah, it is up to me, and, or a sense of vigor, potency, and sort of freedom. Like, yeah, it's me. It's existential freedom and existential responsibility on the one hand. On the other hand, as um, Deb Z points out at five minutes past the hour, 7.05 p.m. Pacific time, what if there is no one but you? And there can be a lot of loneliness in this. It can feel like you're standing atop a tall peak where the air is clear and there's the view is vast, but it's kind of cold and chilly up there and you're all alone. And sometimes people don't like to feel that, which gets in the way of their self-reliance. So as Deb is pointing out, you know, um, are there things that uh, make it difficult for you, this is not so much what Deb is necessarily saying, but just to raise the question, are there things that make it hard for you to claim self-reliance? Such as, and now I'm gonna move from my examples uh, into some of the more of the, some of the meat of this talk, and I'll be dropping in some quotations from the Buddha Dharma to make some of these points. Um, <clears throat> so one of the major impediments to self-reliance is learned helplessness. The acquisition based on lived experience to which we mammals are very vulnerable, the acquisition of a sense of futility and defeat, often with a depressive mood and even at the extreme, an underlying sense of collapse. Learned helplessness really undermines the sense of agency, fancy word, or efficacy, another fancy word, that's central to self-reliance. And I've been listening recent, recently to an interview, and I'm sorry, blanking on the, the her name, of a scholar of hope. And she defines hope as optimism with a plan. So to move forward, we don't need to have certainty of the outcome, but we must have a sense of agency that lights the pilot light if it's gone out, and then from the pilot light helps ourselves keep moving forward. And I've written a lot about how to reclaim the sense of agency if it's been defeated in you or punished or shamed in you, as it can be in different kinds of childhoods. And the ways to develop a sense of agency, especially if it is restricted, including in particular areas. Sometimes people feel a lot of agency, let's say, in their business life, but interpersonally, psh, they feel stuck, passive, defeated, even when, even when sometimes they're not, actually. They could say certain things. They could ask for certain things. They could insist on certain things. They could walk away from certain things, really. Maybe they couldn't when they were young because that would have been very dangerous, perhaps. But as adults, there is a field of power, influence, efficacy uh, uh, that they could step into, but they're inhibited about that. That's a common situation. So one of the ways to help yourself is to look for simple forms of agency. First, in areas where you're comfortable expressing agency, like in my example in business, and then to start getting, getting a feeling of what that's like and start to transfer it, generalize it into that area that's difficult for you. That's one of the dozen top psychological skills, to be able to get in touch with some strength, some way of being, some factor in your psychology that's present for you in one setting or domain or relationship, and then apply it to an area that's more challenging for you. Get in touch with the body sensations here. Get in touch with the attitudes here, the point of view, the beliefs. It can help to write it out. It can help to act it out. It can help even to exaggerate it a little bit. So you're really in it. 
You know this way of being. And then, whoop, now you got to talk to your father. Whoa! (laughs) Or or your neighbor or your kid. Uh, Whoa! But you just hang in there and you transfer over those qualities. That's a very useful general skill. And you can apply it certainly to a sense of agency. So let me now, if I can, bring in some uh, teachings from the Buddha, and then I'll open it up to some of the questions that have come in on the chat and potentially speak with, with one, or, you know, one or two or three of you. If one going down into a river, swollen and swiftly flowing, is carried away by the current, how can one help others across? Right. Put your own oxygen mask on first. And if you belong to a group of people that have been socialized to be highly other-directed and invested in others and to some extent perhaps dependent upon what's happening with others, including their reactions to you, if you've been trained to kind of operate in that way, uh, in such a way that you don't feel entitled morally or it just is unthinkable, to really rely on yourself for your well-being and success and to claim to yourself the, the power, a kind of healthy entitlement to take action as you see fit based on relying on yourself. You know, if especially you've, you've been socialized as to name some groups, or very often girls and, and women are, to feel like, oh, that's not for me, not for me. It's especially important to claim to yourself the moral, the moral basis for self-reliance. Right. Here's another one. One is not low because of birth. In other words, your caste or social class you, you were born into, very revolutionary in the Buddhist time 2,500 years ago in essentially medieval, patriarchal, uh, structured um, India. Uh, one is not low because of birth, nor, nor does birth make one holy. Deeds alone make one low. Deeds alone make one holy. In other words, it's our own deeds, particularly volitional deeds. In the framework of what's been given to us in our circumstances, and our fortune or misfortune, our advantage or disadvantage, it's our deeds in that framework that are deliberate and intentional, that are really the, the engine of whether at one end we become full of suffering <laughs> in some sordid ways, or on the other hand, we find ways to cultivate well-being and inner peace and love and wisdom and move toward, if you will, a kind of holiness. Right? It's because of the actions that we take ourselves. This is totally central to Buddhist teaching. You may disagree with it, it's an offering, but it's right at the center of Buddhism, including the Buddha's critique of, and in effect, revolution in response to the traditionalist, um, Jainist uh, teachings and culture of his time that you know, you're born into certain circumstances, you just do the best you can, you make a lot of offerings for the priests, and hopefully you'll get a better chance next time. The Buddha was not having any of that. Carpe diem. Here's another one. Make an island of yourself. Make yourself your refuge. There is no other refuge. Now, in this, there's a recognition that we draw upon refuges such as um, science and medicine and other people. We draw on refuges such as teachers like the Buddha, communities of the taught, great teachings. You know, there's a place of that. But at the end of the day, the, the value of them is what's internalized. So there's no real refuge, in effect, until we take it into ourselves and we tune into the Buddha within the Dhamma within, the teachings within, and the Sangha within over time, including the internalization of those who have cared about us and helped us along the way. This is where we find our refuge. Here, no mother nor father nor any other kin can do greater good for oneself than a mind directed well. Our mind is our own responsibility. 
We may be stuck in certain bodily conditions, chronic pain, disability, impairments. Um, we may have certain circumstances that are really tough, that are unjust, perhaps. And in all that, we can direct our minds. Unless we're in the moment of extraordinary shock and pain or emotional pain, physical or emotional pain, other than those moments, in principle, we can always find our footing inside our own minds and begin to direct it well. If only to direct it to riding out the storm, simply being with all the, the what we're feeling without being invaded or hijacked by it. A mind directed well. This is the most fundamental aspect of self-reliance because everything else proceeds from that. There's another quotation from the Dhammapada. Maybe someone will put it in the chat. I didn't have it in my notes. The classic one, I think it's the Dhammapada one. You know, mind precedes all things. Mind is the maker of all things. In, in Not in some kind of magical sense or going to materialize a necklace here, but just mind makes how we approach life, how we think about life, how we react to life. Mind is the maker of all things. And, um, you know, the consequences follow like the cart follows the oxen. Mind is the maker of all things. So I'm going to offer a few additional quotations and then we'll kind of open it up here. So one of the fundamental modes of self-reliance, if I were to sum it up for myself, uh, these are, this is a pithy three-part important statement. It's actually the um, opening inscription, I think, in Neurodharma. Train yourself in doing good that lasts and brings happiness. If you're looking for a one-sentence summary of self-reliance, train yourself in doing good that lasts and brings happiness, in the broad sense. Specifically, cultivate generosity. a life of peace, and a mind of boundless love. Beautiful, huh? And can we rely ourselves each day if that teaching is north? <laughs> can we rely on ourselves each day to head north? Get diverted east, west, maybe south sometimes, but on the whole, especially when we recognize that we've kind of lost track of the North Star, can we keep heading north? And then to finish it here. So Bill Murray, that great teacher, I realized the more fun I had, the better I did. You know, self-reliance can feel very, ugh. There's some... Um, I think Emerson wrote an essay, yes, I think, on self-reliance. And, you know, it can feel very ponderous. And, uh, and um, you know, part of being self-reliant is realizing what you can rely on yourself to do to help yourself be, be self-reliant and stay self-reliant along the way. And there's something about lightening up, you know, and, uh, and having more fun. Or in the haiku here from Isa, on a branch, floating down river, and obviously in big trouble, a cricket singing. <laughs> we are all on various branches precariously, floating down rivers. Can we be like the cricket singing? And then Long Chen Pa, that's one of my favorite teachings. Since everything is but an experience, and this is a way of understanding things in a very deep way. Since everything is but an experience, perfect in being what it is, having nothing to do with good or bad, acceptance or rejection, one may well burst out in laughter. To me, as someone in some ways related to recent uh, experiences I've had, 
this teaching is really centered in a kind of Chan or Zen tradition. And in some ways for me a lot, it, it's the expression of Kensho that like, where you realize it's, it's all one vast oneness that's undifferentiated at its ground. And, and you are that stuck. Well, you may as well burst out in laughter. Okay. All right. I hope that was helpful. Self-reliance. Any questions? The last quote was from Long Chen Pa. Long Chen Pa. And, you know, sometimes you'll find different um, spellings uh, or pronunciations of these names. All right. Yeah, Katie's making a great point. It's 722. I, I tried to hedge it a little bit. This is a way of relating to the universe as it is and in which there's a recognition of all the things occurring in the universe as it is, including the experiences we're having. And it's a way. It's not uh, a rule. And obviously it should not and does not, um, you know, and should not be the basis for a spiritual bypass that lets us, you know, look at poverty and the horrors of the world and go, oh, well, it's, you know, let's all laugh. No, it's a good point, Katie. Okay. The point I was just trying to get at is, uh, you know, when we're into the self-reliance, um, you know, uh, we can lighten up about it. Now, WY, uh, 722 PM is talking to me as an overly self-reliant person. And this is where, I'm so glad you brought this up. Um, can you say something on the detriments of self-reliance or being overly self-reliant? Extremely good point. So <clears throat> sometimes we grow up in environments in which the takeaway is that no one's coming, we can't rely on others, and we don't establish even at the core, the bottom, what Eric Erickson called basic trust in reality. So we feel that we're, you know, Underneath it all, we're beleaguered, separated, and alone, maybe, as an aspect of self-reliance. Or there could just be a presumption that we're not allowed to ask for help, it's, or that beyond that rule, let's say, that it would be dangerous to ask for help or dangerous to rely on others. You know? And those can get in the way of healthy, those beliefs, those, those feelings that sometimes that underlying emotional material can definitely get in the way of healthy, effective relationships. So that's something to be aware of. And um, here is where I think that um, it's helpful to, to kind of keep coming back to self-reliance as what's your origin point? That's what the Buddha spoke to. Mind is the maker of all things. What's the point of origin? And in the point of origin, is there a presumption that it's others that are the source, the primary source of your being, or they're external factors that are the primary source of how you are? Or is there the capacity, especially in certain important regards, to access a kind of underlying engine, kind of an underlying engine? That's the initiator. Now, in that initiation, one of the um, first steps coming from your reliance upon yourself is to reach out for help, is to look for expertise, to form a treatment team. A lot of people have lingering health problems that because they don't really have a team that's, you know, as best they can cobble together, acknowledging all the messed upness of the healthcare system still you know we you know it's important to reach out to others you know, to to learn from others to seek teachers to look for people who are farther along than you in some particular way and to to learn from them to model them to internalize them yeah absolutely so i'm so glad you brought that up um, and also rachel just before that very right there right there um, we can rely upon ourselves we can we can express and enact self-reliance by in, in ways that might be reaching out to others with humility and vulnerability um, and courageous requests. That could be 
an expression of self-reliance. Uh, we can do what I did earlier today with somebody who's a producer, and I was recording a, a thing with Forrest, um, our son, for the related to the Being Well podcast. And I said, "Hey, you know, you're a pro. You've been listening to all this stuff. How could I do better?" And you know, that can be a form of self-reliance. All right. I see that Joe has his hand up. Let's. I'm going to ask you to unmute Joe, and then uh, with you, we'll finish up the meeting tonight. So, Joe, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, and you might want to turn on your camera, too. You there? Okay, great. Yeah, and as usual, please cut to the chase, make it relevant, blah, blah. All right, so here, here is as much chase. I'm having problems with my serious microphone, so bear with me. Um, I was listening to what you were saying. I was agreeing with 90% of it. I was noticing that over the course of a year and a half of listening to you, to you and practicing what you were talking about, that there have been major changes in my own sense of well-being inside. But when oh, you good. said something- I'm glad for you. Time, yeah. Thank you. I thank, th actually, thank you very much. Because yeah, we know each other quite, quite well in certain ways. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so go on. Yeah. All right. When you said something about self-reliance and it's up to you, I was suddenly transported somewhere else. Mm. <laughs> and where, let me just tell you where I was transported to. It was, there was, a, I think, an instantaneous sense of shame, inadequacy, mm. um, why aren't you doing better? You know, yeah. my, my ninth grade teacher saying, um, you do really well in all the achievement tests, but you're not going to even get into college unless you work harder. Mm. Um, <laughs> and other useless yeah. shaming con concepts. Um, I'm so glad you were, I mean, tip of the hat to you for that kind of real-time self-awareness. Yeah. The real-time self-awareness comes from finally learning how to meditate effectively, I think, mm. and, and being and being ever so happy of being in the present moment um, and, and with a large sense of acceptance. Yeah, and if I could highlight something you're saying there, Joe, uh, just like, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. And in other words, what I mean by that is very often <coughs> We, we head in a good direction or we try to get something going in our minds and it associates to the opposite in the brain, yin and yang. It just, do, do, A, not A. You know, it goes to the opposite, figure, ground. And so there you are. And then you, it's not uncommon when we call ourselves to be, let's say, self-reliant. What comes up sometimes is a history of maybe defeat about that. And then we tried to do something we counted on ourselves for something, and it was a flop. It didn't go anywhere. It wasn't. It wasn't successful, or people were against it. So yeah, that can definitely surface. And I'm glad you're naming it. And as you, as you know, there you are. Okay, thanks, Rick. Great. You surface this whole crud. What a. But no, I know you're cool. And yep, it surfaced. All right. What a gift. That old crud. Has got, which has to be experienced out if it is to be released. So it has to become conscious on its way out the door. It has to pass through the inner mud room, which is a two-way street, on its way out the door, right? And okay, then you release it and then you keep coming back to, oh, well, here and now today in my life, can I claim a kind of ownership of my own life in some broad sense? you know, including in areas where maybe I've been more passive than I really need to be, or areas where I've presumed that other people are going to handle stuff or take care of me in ways maybe they ought to, but they're not going to. What can I do now, even with this old material from my childhood, but to realize, you know, here today, I can Claim the power that I do have, right? And rely on myself for that and not look outside uh, in ways that are overly passive and inert and, and sort of anticipatory defeat. 
that's the process. And can I, I, you, can I say one, one more thing? I've got to really wrap up, but can you just, is it a passing comment to finish up here? Yeah, it's, it's more or less my reaction to what you said. It seems to me that it's easier to be self-reliant if you're coming from a sense of liking yourself from your own, noticing your own good heart and so forth. Um, yeah. I was actually shocked to feel this sudden wave of whatever it was. But I think that rather than trying to argue with it, coming back to some feeling of self worth yeah. is the best way of dealing with it. That's true. Oh, that's lovely. I'm really glad we, we finished on that. That's a lovely, lovely ending, Joe. Thank you, really. Yeah. Well, everyone, um, we're wrapping up here. And so uh, I wanted to say thank you. We've come to a formal end. And you know, one thing, by the way, to reflect on is that as we increasingly claim for ourselves a reliance upon ourselves, Others can rely on us more. And when we are with people who own the foundation of self-reliance, then we can rely more upon them. And that's a beautiful thing as we practice together. So thank you. I rely on you for your practice. Like you could see Joe there. He's practicing. I rely on that. And I appreciate that. Really. I hope you enjoyed that talk. I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free.